Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. We just want to, first of all, just apologize for the late start um, this, this afternoon. Um, we know that God is a good God. And so I'll just ask you to indulge us with a little bit more patience as we get into the workshop. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a moment just to pray. And then I want to just share a few things with you that will be coming up in the area. So let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are Lord of all. And Father, even when sometimes things go outside of our control, they are never out of your control. So Father, may you continue to be with everything. May you allow for all things to work together according to its proper purpose. And Father, we trust you in all things. And Father, we are excited that we have this opportunity to come together as an area to continue to seek your face, to continue to grow closer to, to, to each other, but most importantly, closer to you. So we thank you for what you have done, what you'll continue to do in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Just wanna take a moment at this time um, we know many of our churches are beginning to stream and we're gonna go back um, into our program. We, we are excited because we have been able to do these workshop series. The workshop series are intended to help to build us and as we prepare and march towards our work of evangelism in the New England North area. We are excited because as pastors, we have been coming collectively. We've been meeting regularly to take a look at what, the, what vision we as pastors have for this area. And pretty soon we will be coming to each of our churches so that we collectively can come together with a long-term vision for this area. But as we do that, we do not wanna neglect the mandate that God has given to us. And that is to preach the everlasting gospel into all the world, to carry the message of the hour of judgment, but of the good news of God's saving grace. And I'm excited that when we see all that is going on around us, we can rejoice because God is still on the throne and he is doing great things. And so it brings me great joy and privilege. As we know, we are marching towards our evangelistic series, which will begin April 3rd through 17th. And so we've asked you to save the date on your calendars. And we pray that each of your respective boards have met, have carved out that date so that we can work together for evangelism. But I want for us to know this one thing that we are excited because we have been able to secure and solidify our, our speaker who has been praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to provide him with a, a special series of messages as we embark on Evangelism 2021. And so our speaker will be none other than our own Dr. Lazarus Castang. We are excited that he will minister to us through the Reach Out for Life evangelistic campaign. And so we have been praying and we pray that you've been praying. And as we've been going through this process of getting ourselves prepared, the next couple of weeks, we will have continued seminars that will allow for us to prepare to prepare each one of you and to prepare ourselves for this work. But we need you to do something. We want you to start to get the word out. The flyers and the, 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 the promotions will be available shortly. And we want you to start to get the word out to your neighbors, your coworkers. We want you to get the word out to your friends and your families. For we want them to know that they can reach out for life because pretty soon Jesus will come. And we don't want anyone to be left behind. You see, the work that we do is a work that requires all of us collaboratively, collaboratively to do it. I pray that we, we all understand that it's not the work of the pastors, nor is it the work of the Bible workers, but it is the work of every member, whether you are a church leader, administrator, an elder, a deacon, personal ministries member, or whether you just sit in the back row, God still requires all of us to do the same thing. And so once again, I am excited to announce to you that Dr. Lazarus Castang will be our speaker for the Reach Out for Life evangelistic series. So stay tuned for more details of, about the series. 
But praise God, praise God, praise God. We are ready to move the way God wants us to move, April 3rd to 17th. So please mark those dates. So I'm gonna invite you just to give us another moment. We will be on the air shortly as we prepare for a very important seminar that will be presented to us by Dr. James Jensen. God bless you.
I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on that sea of glass, having the hearts of God, and they sing. The song of Moses, the servant 
of God and the song of the Lamb sing.
Whether you're experiencing sunshine in your life today or things seems to be falling apart, one thing that you can rest assured is that Jesus loves you and he is just a prayer away. And so at this time, I would like to invite you, wherever you are, just to bow your heads with us as we pray. Our Father and our God, thank you. Thank you for being such a loving God. Thank you for giving us the privilege to join this platform this afternoon where we can learn so much about you, what it means for you to walk beside us, what it means to live with you, not only in this life, but also to prepare for eternity. Thank you for every person that have joined this platform this afternoon. We seek your face and we seek a blessing. Disappoint us not, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, saints and friends, I would just like to welcome all of you to our Christian Living Workshop this afternoon that will be br uh, 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 brought to us by our dear friend and colleague, Do Dr. Jansen. We look forward to having a great time with you. Uh, there will be a time that you will have the opportunity to write some questions in the chat. And as the pastors, as we come along, we'll do our best to answer those questions as best as and honestly as we can. And so welcome, everybody. Great to see you. I hope this experience will be uh, life-changing and that uh, it will be something that you will be talking about throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Christian Living um, Seminar um, and Workshop. We are excited uh, that you have been able to come. Now, we'll talk about some very important things this afternoon. Uh, we want to be able to engage you. We want you to engage with us. Um, as you know, the topic of Christian um, Living is one of those topics that um, can get us as Adventists riled up. Uh, it's one of those topics that we um, get very excited and passionate about. Um, we did do um, an earlier segment on this uh, Christian living. Um, and so today we are going to go a little deeper um, in Christian living. There is a part two that will be coming up. Uh, and so we wanna frame Christian living in a way that will help us to understand what it means to live for Christ or reflect Christ um, in these uncertain times. So best way to benefit from this is as we go along, I need you to write your questions down. So when we get to the section where we discuss with um, um, the pastoral team, um, you would be able to put your questions in and we will address um, those questions. So let's pray as we go into uh, this presentation. Father, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your grace. We ask that you will be with us and that you will instruct us. You are a mighty God, and we thank you. You are God. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have friends and, and others who may benefit from this, this is the opportunity to send them the link um, and tell them to come on board. Uh, they're going to be blessed. Christian living. Um, we're looking at a very important uh, topic of uh, the foundations of our Christian um, life. Um, many of you have heard recently about uh, the Ravi Zacharias uh, scandal. This is one of the headlines regarding to that scandal. Zacharias hid hundreds of pictures of women, abuse during massages, and rape allegation. This is from Christianity Today. We think of this situation. Uh, Ravi Zacharias is known to be um, one of the foremost uh, leading Christian apologetic. Uh, he was well known and well respected, um, seemed by all appearances to be uh, a decent Christian uh, gentleman. People uh, uh, respected uh, his, his, his ministry. But now um, in his death, he died last year, um, all of these allegations have come up. They've, they've been investigated um, and, and they've been found to be true. Um, in fact, more than the allegations were, were discovered. And so you ask yourself, well, well wait a while. How does this relate to Christian living? And, and perhaps someone will say, well, he wasn't one of us. He wasn't Adventist, so perhaps that's the issue. 
But let's go a little further. Um, in 2000 and uh, in 2003, um, we uh, read this uh, headline in the New York Times, uh, Rwandan uh, uh, pastor and his son are convicted of genocide. You go a little further and you read that this uh, Rwandan pastor was a former head. He was a conference person, former head of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Western Rwanda. He's sentenced to 10 years. And his son, who is a graduate of Loma Linda, um, he was sentenced to 25 years for the crimes, uh, all the same crimes that the father committed, um, and for shooting two people to death. Now, that there troubles me because uh, as far as I know, um, you will not get to be a, an Adventist conference president if you are not living up to the behavior standards of the church, right? You you would have had to uh, pass, pass certain tests. You would have had to go through uh, a certain vetting process. You don't get there by just showing up you get there by paying your dues, apparently. Now, this conference president and his son, they were uh, the first, uh, uh, the, the conference president was the first clergy to be charged with genocide in uh, 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 that, 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 that gruesome, gruesome uh, uh, reality of what took place in Rwanda. And so you ask yourself the question, well, if he was a good enough Adventist to be a pastor, if he was a good enough Adventist to become even a conference president, what is it that went wrong that will cause him to spearhead destruction of fellow Adventists? Now, not even to talk about non-Christians, but fellow Adventists who happen to be from the other tribe. Why would he even be involved in this? Why would an Adventist make the headlines for this? How would someone who is one of the leaders of our hospitals, graduated from one of our schools, be convicted with this? What is going on? Now, let's step back a bit. In our previous presentation, we asked a few key questions. We asked about how does the cross of Christ inform our Christian um, walk? What are the imperatives of Christian experience? What are the practical implications of walking um, with Christ? How do we live holy uh, lives in a sinful world? Those are the things that we looked at. Those are the questions we sought to answer. Previously as well, we looked at stewardship of life. That when we talked about Christian living, we're not talking about one aspect of your life. We're talking about the totality of your Christian experience. Previously, we looked at four core principles of uh, a Christian living. We looked at values and standards. Next slide. We looked at mind and contemplation, allegiance and priority, sacrifice and service. So those were the key areas that Christian living relates to our values and standards. Christian living's living relates to our thinking, our contemplation, our mind. It relates to our allegiance and our priority, who is our Lord, and our sacrifice and service. Who is the one who receives our sacrifice and um, our service? Now, in uh, uh, Christian Belief uh, uh, 21, the Fundamental Belief uh, 22, sorry, we have a summary of what the Adventist Church teaches as it relates to Christian living or Christian behavior. Now, I find this um, summary to be very powerful um, as we frame our discussion, um, and I'm going to point to a few key things um, in this doctrinal statement. Uh, we are called to be godly people. That there stands out, godly. You can circle that, godly. We are called to be a godly people. It means that for us as Adventists, at least in our official belief, Godliness is the standard of our lives. So we're called to be godly people who think. Notice that there is something that uh, uh, relates to the mind, who think, feel, something that relates to the emotions, and act in harmony with the principles of heaven. Now that there is powerful. We can spend the rest of the year just unpacking that, that as a church, based on the word of God, we believe that we are called to be godly people. So if we are Adventist and we're not godly, then we're not consistent with what we claim to believe. This godliness informs how we think. It in fact, it, it impacts on our feelings. It impacts on our actions. Our actions, our thinking, our feelings must be in harmony with heaven. Notice, for the spirit to recreate in us the character of our Lord, 
that's our focus, that there is powerful as well. We want the Holy Spirit to recreate in us the character of the Lord. So godliness is the standard, but that standard is expressed through Christ-like character, right? In order for that to take place, here is what we're committed to. We involve ourselves only in those things which will produce Christ-like uh, purity. Have mercy. So, so this here is now radical. So, so we're saying that because we want the Spirit to create in us the character of Christ, to recreate in us the character of Christ, there is something that we have to do. So Christ has died for us. Christ has given us salvation. And, 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 and in response to that, because we want to manifest the character of Christ, what is it? What is our responsibility? What is our covenant obligation? Well, we are only involved in the things that will produce Christ by purity. Have mercy. The things that will produce health, and joy. This one uh, has set me for a loop uh, for a bit because it's not too often that we consider or or, 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 or we associate Christian living with joy. Uh, but, but our belief is that Christian living should be a joy. We're not meant to live a boring life. That whatever we're involved in uh, ultimately should bring joy on the basis of what the Spirit of God is doing. This means that our amusement and entertainment should meet the highest standards of Christian taste and beauty. Now, again, this here uh, 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 goes, uh, uh, challenges me a bit because whenever we talk about Christian living, very often it seems that you have to get rid of amusement. You have to get rid of entertainment. No entertainment, no amusement. But what we what we teach officially at, as a church says the issue is not whether or not we have amusement. Amusement is okay. Entertainment is okay as long as it meets the highest standard of Christian taste and beauty. That means that the the shows that I look at, the the books that I read, the music that I listen to, that where, where whether I go to an amusement park or, or not, whatever I do for amusement or entertainment must meet the highest standard of Christian living. Have mercy. Uh, 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 the, 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 the doctrine continues. While recognizing, again, this is powerful, while recognizing cultural differences. So as a church, we do recognize that culture impacts on how we interpret Christian living. So the church says we recognize cultural differences. The church cannot go against cultural differences. In other words, we don't have a cookie cutter uh, uh, measurement in working this through. That the ways that this is applied in North America might be different from the ways it might be applied in the Caribbean or the ways it might be applied in India or the ways that it might be applied in Australia. That we have various cultural differences differences that impact on the way that we see this. And this is a mistake that we make very often. We try to have a one size fit all. And, 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 and so we, we have one standard and very often we take a standard uh, that is informed by someone who has feelings of cultural supremacy. And so uh, as I shared with our Hyde Park family at some, some time ago, um, last week actually, that the early Christian missionaries, what they did was that they violated cultural autonomy and they superimposed European standards of, of, of beauty, European standards uh, of, of, of Christian living, and they superimposed that on the peoples uh, that they supposedly were, were, were Christianizing. Have mercy. That, that's another conversation. Seriously problematic. But our church recognizes that there are cultural differences. And, and But here is the principle. Beneath those cultural differences, the church then then suggest that our dress, our attire, should be simple in whatever cultural form that is, modest, neat, befitting those who whose true beauty does not consist of the outward adornment, but in the imperishable or ornament of a gentle, quiet spirit. What this says is that the focus in whichever culture you you find yourself in, however your cultural expression, at the heart of this, your priority should be on what Christ is doing in the heart, what Christ is doing on the inside. And so what you demonstrate on the outside, while it might look different from culture to culture, what will be the 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 the, the 
uh, uh, the attractive part of you is not so much your ostentation or your decoration on the outside, but it will be that which comes from being converted. That's that's powerful. So the church says that's where the emphasis is. Is also it also means that because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are to care for them intelligently, very powerful, right? We're going to take care of our physical bodies. It's what Christ asks us to do. Along with adequate exercise rest, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from unclean foods identified in the scriptures. Seems very uh, uh, normal that, that ultimately, because we belong to God, whatever we do is a holistic. We want to make sure that we are the healthiest people. We want to make sure that we are honoring God in every aspect of our being. Now, this, this means, and, 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 and get this here, this means that the church, based on its official teaching, will place lack of exercise, lack of rest on the same level as eating unclean foods. You get that? That, that the church will place, and, and I believe the scripture supports this, that not having a healthy lifestyle in terms of diet, in terms of, of exercise, in terms of rest, is on the very same level as eating pork, right? That, that ultimately, whatever harms the body is, is, is disrespectful to the creator. Uh, the last part of this uh, doctrine says, since alcoholic beverages, tobacco, uh, 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 and the irresponsible use of drugs, Adventists are not against using medication. Other religions, other denominations are, but Adventists are not against using uh, medication when it's required. So it's the irresponsible use of drugs and um, nar narcotic are harmful for our uh, to our bodies. We are to abstain from them as well. So this is temperance, right? So the moderate use of that, which is good. Those of you who came up in Pathfinders, right? And, and the, the abstinence from that, which um, is, is bad, is bad for you. All right, so we, we, we go a step further. Instead, we are to engage in whatever brings our thoughts and our bodies into the discipline of Christ. I love this line here. Whatever we engage in brings us into the discipline of Christ who desires our wholesomeness. Amen. This is what Christ is after. He wants us to be whole. And, 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 and with this, he wants us to have joy and he wants us to have goodness. This is powerful, right? So this is the essence of our teaching on Christian behavior. These are the passages um, that relate to that doctrine number 22. All right, now let's delve in. So that's the background. That's the framework. That's what we teach officially as a church. Now, Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle has been shaped in in a particular context. When we discuss and try to understand Christian living within the Adventist context, we must take into consideration that the Adv that Adventism was shaped in a particular milieu. Adventism was shaped in America in the 1800s, right? It, 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 and so whatever was taking place in America in the 1800s affected Adventists and the ways Adventists interpreted and applied these things. Adventism was also, our Adventist lifestyle, also impacted on by American Protestantism, uh, American Puritanism, and, and the values of Puritanism, Methodism, American Baptist. Uh, there are other groups, but the, the, the Adventism was shaped by all of these. Many of our pioneers came from some of these groups. Ellen White, for example, came from Methodism. And when you read uh, John Wesley's work um, and you look at, in fact, when you have some time, go through the hymnal and look for the songs that are written by John and Charles Wesley. And you will see the emphasis on holiness, the emphasis on purity. They do have a strong emphasis on the gospel as well, but there's a very strong emphasis on holiness. Now, there's nothing wrong with it, but I think what we need to understand is that in order to appreciate uh, and understand why Adventists have interpreted and applied the certain biblical teachings in particular way, we need to understand where it came from, where this was nurtured. All right, we're moving on. Living the Christ life at the heart of this is not I, but Christ. Whenever we talk about Christian living, here is how I want to summarize this. We're talking about imitating and reflecting Christ. This is the heart of Christian living. If you miss everything else that I say today, don't miss this. This here is the heart of Christian living. Christian living 
in these times is about imitating and reflecting Christ. That's the heart of this. So we're looking at Christ surrender to the Father's will. If we are going to live, we are going to surrender to the Father's will. If we're going to practice Christian living, we're going to have daily communion with heaven through prayer and Bible study. That's what Jesus taught us. We will imitate that and we will reflect him. We will love sinners while we hate sin. We will also have service to humanity. We will respond to conflict and criticism and challenges in a particular way. So it's going to impact on our temper. It's going to impact on our relationships. Um, uh, uh, there will be sacrifice and humility. That's what we see in the life of Christ. Ministry uh, of healing and regeneration. Our lives will actually make a difference in the lives of others and, and mentorship and discipleship. Now, I want you to notice that at the core of this, we have maintained the essence of the teaching of the church, that we want godliness. We want the character of Christ to be made manifest. Now, we have interpreted and applied those things in some very specific ways. And I want you to recognize that in many of those specific ways, cultural variables will affect the way we work this through. But this here is a universal standard. If we're going to imitate Christ, we have one Christ. And we have his life outlined in scripture. You go to scripture. And if, if Christ says, let this mind be in you, which, which Paul says, sorry, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we're going to imitate Christ, this here is the essence of the character of Christ. So whether or not someone's cultural application of a particular principle is acceptable to us or not, whatever we demonstrate in terms of our character must reflect the essence of Christ and his ministry. Now, let's go a step further. So what is Christian living? How do we define this? So I've been defining all along. And so I want to zero in on what we see coming out of scripture, what we see coming out of the teachings of the church. First, and get this, Christian living is God's response through us to his grace. Get that. That when you look at godliness, how do you get godliness? When you look at Christian character or Christ-like character, how do you get that? Well, it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so on the first level, God is responding to his grace through us. It is Christ in me that is working this through. In other words, Christian living is not me sitting down and saying, I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't do that, I would No, Christian living, first and foremost, is me saying, live out your life within me, God. And so God in me responds to his grace. I am no longer in control. God is in control. So I don't get to make a decision that says, I, 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 I don't want to do that or I want to do this. No, God, what is your will? And whatever God's will is, will be aligned with his word. Secondly, Christian living is our total response, our total response to experiencing Christ's love. This is holistic. Once we have experienced Christ uh, and, and his sacrifice, Christian living becomes the holistic uh, uh, response to Christ in the sense that, Every aspect of my life becomes an act of worship as I commune with God, as I say, thank you, God, for your grace. The way I dress, the way I carry myself, the way I, I eat, uh, the way I relate to others, the, whatever it is, that whatever I do is a part of my response to experiencing Christ. The challenge is very often we try to teach Christian living without first introducing people to Christ. We want to cut pork out of their diet before they meet the Savior who died for them. We want them to take off jewelry and we want them uh, to dress a particular way so that they could meet Christ. It doesn't work that way. That Christian living is a response to experiencing God's love. Once we have experienced God's love, then that is what dictates how we're going to live. Christian living is also manifesting Christ's glory. The out, outworking of Christ in us. Again, Christian living says Christ is going to be seen in me. So here, here is the paradox that we see that in the two examples that I shared at the beginning, you have this great Christian leader who on the outside seemed as though he was a good Christian. But in private, there were many who experienced this person as anything less 
everything else, sorry, but a Christian, right? Could you imagine what this did to their minds? We're listening to this person preach. We're listening to this person teach. We're listening to all of these things that this person is doing. Yet, how could he abuse me? How could he take advantage of me? How could he be so cruel? But here's the thing. The standard is not set by the church. Neither is the standard set by appearances. Because if the standard were set by appearances, then that conference president, he should be all clear because the church saw enough in him to vote him to be a conference president. Whether or not he politics for it is not my issue, but he was made a conference president. His son was made head of one of our hospitals. That the Christian living that we're talking about here is not something that is judged by someone looking on and saying, all right, you have Christian living. No, we have to answer to God. Is Christ being demonstrated in our lives? This is not a show. This is not a, a, a putting on a mask. This here needs is grounded in a, a transformation. It is grounded in the conversion experience. All right, let's let's move on. Here is what the Word of God says. Therefore, Philippians chapter two, verses twelve to sixteen. Therefore, my beloved. As you have always obeyed, and what you're going to notice as we go through these passages, I'm not going to be doing proof texting. I can pull one text here and another text there uh, and, and, and sprinkle it around. The passages that I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote them in their context because that's what we want to focus on. Very often when we, we do these kinds of teaching, we pull a passage here and we pull a text there. You know, I mean, I don't have a problem if you choose to do that, uh, but if we're gonna understand what the scripture says, we need to discipline ourselves to look at what we're reading in context. Now, uh, so Paul says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. So this is a constant way of life that you have had, Paul is saying, but now more in my absence. I know that in my presence, you have demonstrated obedience. And now in my absence is even more necessary. It's the core of who you are. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Wait a while, I thought we were saved by grace through faith. By, by grace through faith. Yes, we are. That's the foundation. What Paul is talking about is what comes out of that salvation experience. And that's why he says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That, that, that your obedience then is God working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is not something that you will yourself do. It is something that God does in and through you. The next verse uh, says, do all things without complaining and disputing. God is working out his will in me. He is working in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure that you may become blameless and harmless. That's Christian character. But it starts off with God working out his will in me. He is the one doing it through me. Children of God without fault uh, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. This is how we are manifesting and reflecting Christ, among whom you shine as lights in the world. How do you get to shine as lights in the world? Well, God has to be working in your life. And Paul is saying to them, I don't want you to just put this on or put on a face. I need you to continue doing this in my presence as well as in my absence. There is a consistency, whether in public or in private, your light needs to shine. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. This is powerful. Paul says, listen. I need you to continue that Christian living until Christ comes so that ultimately I would rejoice with you that my labor was not in vain, that, that you didn't just accept Christ and you didn't grow. You didn't just say, yes, I surrender to Jesus and there was no spiritual growth. Paul says your spiritual growth should be a part of you throughout your Christian experience. Moving on, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Another passage that helps us understand Christian living. Uh, Paul again says, therefore, be imitators of God as their children. Have mercy. Imitators of God. Well, God was revealed in and through Jesus Christ. If we want to imitate God, we need to look at Jesus Christ. And he says, and walk in love. This is all a part of the experience of imitation. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a sweet smelling savor. Now, I love that imagery. 
that, that Paul says your Christian life, your life of sacrifice is supposed to be like Christ's life, a, 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 a sweet smelling savor. It is supposed to be something that God is pleased with. So Christian living then is not to impress the church. Christian living is not to impress those around us. Christian living is actually our offering to God as a sacrifice uh, uh, that is a sweet aroma that God is there in heaven and he looks at what comes out of us based on what he is doing in us. And God says, mm, that smells good. And this here is a powerful experience. Now move on, next verse says, Notice here, this is what should be avoided. He says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Woo. Paul says these kinds of expressions of brokenness should not even be named among you. This is how disciplined your Christian experience should be as Christ works in you. He says, as is fitting for saints. You are saints. You are holy. God calls you saints. God calls us saints. Have mercy. Neither filthiness, watch this, nor foolish talking. This is empty talking where we just shoot the breeze, as it were. We're just sitting down talking about nothing that is constructive. Paul says this should not be. He says, nor coarse jesting. No, people say they're just joking, but the, the, the kind of joke uh, that jokes that they make is coarse. It is not. It, it is not a, a, a something that is befitting of of a Christian. And the thing about it, we sit down and we laugh at these jokes. Uh, we sit down. People make these jokes. They make them in passing. Paul says, no. If Christ is working in you, even in the way that you joke around, have mercy. Christ is going to be seen. Now, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have joy. You will have joy, but your joy will be guided by your Christian experience. That therefore means that if I'm going to sit down and look at a comedy, help me, Holy Ghost, if I'm going to sit down and look at a comedy or whatever it is, if the jesting in that comedy constitutes coarse jesting, where they're making all kinds of references that demean uh, uh, sexuality, that demean human being, that demeans, uh, demeans others, that, that, that I need to step away from it because it does not give glory to God. Here he says, but rather, I love this, but rather giving thanks. This is what should constitute our life. Giving thanks for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. In other words, he says that there, there, there are some behaviors that are so diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God that you cannot call yourself a Christian if you are practicing a particular type of lifestyle, now this here weighs heavily on my heart. Let's 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 move on to the next uh, to the next verse. Now Paul says, "Now let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience." He is clear that there is judgment that relates to these actions. Therefore. Do not be partakers of them. Stay away from these actions for you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Notice there is a definitive change that occurs. You were once in darkness. You once followed the flesh, but something has occurred in your life. Therefore, your lifestyle is now different. You have experienced Jesus Christ. You are now light in the world, in the Lord. He says, walk as children of light light. In everything that we do, walk as children of life. He says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That is what will come out. Now, now here, here is the thing that challenges me. Very often, I think, based on our Puritan background and based on the aspects of American Protestantism that we have embraced or that, that nurtured us as Adventists, when we present Christian living we focus so much on the things that people need to take off and very little on what needs to take place on the inside. So what we have are people who look the part of a good Adventist, but are still in darkness 
by their lifestyle. They're still in darkness by the way that they treat others. They're still in darkness by their attitude. They're still in darkness. It's for that reason, for that reason, that in so many cases, we find ourselves shocked because we're saying, well, hey, this was a good Adventist. This person didn't wear the things that they weren't supposed to wear. This person did not uh, eat the things that they weren't supposed to eat. This person followed all the laws. How could they do this? Well, Christian change does not come about except conversion occurs. And that is something that Christ has to do in us. And so Paul says, we, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, in righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That is what we present. Our lives are an offering to the Lord. As we give that offering to the Lord, we're giving that which is acceptable. Again, Christian living is not to impress the church. Christian living is to give honor and glory to God. All right. Now, there's an analogy that I found in Scripture that has helped me uh, to uh, understand and appreciate Christian living. I want to look at this analogy. When you have some time, take some time and look at these uh, uh, passages. I think that Christian living is best summarized in Scripture through what is called the seed analogy. When you look at Matthew 13, uh, there are three seeds analogy uh, that I think analogies uh, that I think help us understand Christian living. The first is in verses 18 through 23, where the, the, the Bible talks about um, the, the fact that the seed is the word. And when Jesus uh, gave the parable of the sower, and then he interprets the parable of the sower in those verses, he says the seed that is sown is his word, right? That those who hear the word and they respond to the word. So Christian living, get this, begins when the seed of the word is planted in good soil. The soil, of course, is the heart. That when 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 all of the rocks are removed from our hearts, when all of the distractions are removed, and I, I love that parable because Christ does not condemn the soils. He doesn't condemn the soil. He simply describes what good soil is, right? And that when there is good soil, that there is a harvest, some 100, some 60, and some 30 fall, that it will bear fruit fruit, but the seed of the word needs to find a place where it can rest. So Christian living begins when the seed of the word is planted in us. That results in a radical change because at our core now, we have a different principle that guides our lives. It is the kingdom principle that is planted. So Christian living is seed that is planted. But also in Matthew 13 verse 38, the Bible says that the seed uh, represents the kingdom, uh, the kingdom children or the sons of God. Jesus says the, the good seed in the parable of the wheat and the tears, Jesus says the good seed represent the sons of the kingdom or kingdom children. Now here, uh, Jesus suggests that not only is the seed of the word planted in us, but once the seed of the word is planted in us, we become seeds that he plants in the world. Have mercy. And so, so once we become seeds, watch this, Seeds have within themselves all of the power and the capacity to become what they were destined to become. In other words, if you take a, 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 a mango seed, within the mango seed, the mango seed has everything that it needs to become a mango tree and to bear mangoes, right? So, so here Jesus says uh, concerning his, his kingdom children, he says, because the seed of the word has been planted in you, you now become seed because why? You now have the word of God in you and that has transformed your life. And so now God says, I will plant you in the world, amen, so that you will bear witness to me. You will uh, 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 represent me. Now, this means that when Christ plants us as his children, we have everything within us. He has given us everything that we need for godliness, everything that we need to live lives that will bring honor and glory to his name. Now think about that. If you are a seed, you need to ask yourself, what kind of seed am I? Am I a seed of the kingdom or am I a seed planted by the enemy? Because the enemy plants seeds as well. The third seed analogy in Matthew 13 is that the kingdom itself, is a seed. It's like a mustard seed. And so this is the collective. So as individuals, the seed is planted in us. We respond to the word. 
As we grow in our Christian experience, God now says, now that I'm living my life in you, you are my seed and I am planting you in the world and I need you to represent me until the time of harvest. I need you to do that. But then God turns to the collective that is his church and he now says, my kingdom on earth is as mustard seed or as leaven. That wherever it is that you are planted or placed, you will make a difference in that place. In the case of the mustard seed, it becomes a tree that is so powerful. The branches reach far and wide. Birds come from everywhere. It becomes a kingdom that actually draws attention to Christ. But much like the leaven, it also works from the inside out. In other words, wherever the church of Christ is planted, it should transform that place. So, so when we think of Christian living and Christian behavior, it is not simply our personal actions. Yes, that's important. It is not simply Christ in me, the hope of glory. Yes, that's important. But it also involves the fact that we are seeds. And it also uh, involves the fact that God's church is a seed. It may start off in an insignificant way, but it has the capacity to grow like the early church and transform the world. If the church is not transforming the world, then the church has ceased to be seed and the church is no longer demonstrating Christian behavior. If the world is transforming the church, then the church has lost its uh, 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 capacity. It has lost its purpose. All right, move on. In, in John chapter 14, uh, verses uh, uh, 23 uh, through 26, we have the culmination of the seed analogy. And I, wa I love what John says. And I think this helps us understand a little better what takes place in Christian living. He says, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour is coming when the son of man shall be glorified. I know that that's too small. I should have made it a little bigger. Um, most assuredly, he says, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Have mercy. If anyone serves me, let him, uh, uh, Jesus says, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servants will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. Now here, here's the seed analogy. Jesus says, understand, here is how seeds work. Seeds must die before they can bear fruit. So on the individual level, here is what happens. The seed of the word comes into us. That seed first dies and then it generates life in us. Now, here is what the seed does. The seed kills self in me. The seed kills the I in me. And so now Paul will say, not I, but Christ. Something has occurred that when once I become seed, that I die, self dies. And ultimately because self dies, then the door is open for now God to do what he needs to do. So Christ brings this together, says, hey, you can't love your life in this world and consider yourself to be a, a, a follower of Christ. Christian living requires that you die. You die. Here, here, here is how, how this challenges me. It therefore means that when I am thinking about my diet, let's, let's use diet. Self in me says, I want this. But the spirit says, this is not good for you. Because self dies, I yield to the spirit. When I dress, self in me says, I want to do this to show off my, my, my substance. I want to do this so that attention can be drawn to myself. I want to do this so I can stop stop people in their tracks and they will stop and look at me. Uh, you know, whether that is in the car that I drive, yes, or the hat that I wear or the big old brooch that I wear or uh, the brand name suit that I wear or whatever it is, that's jewelry too, uh, whatever it is, right? If I am doing this to draw attention to myself, now understand the word of God challenges me and says, uh-uh, self must die, Christ must reign. Now, I can't look at you and then say to you, well, you, uh, self is not dead in you. No, I don't have that prerogative. You don't have to answer to me. You have to answer to God. We all have to answer uh, to God. All right, so let's bring this all together. 
and, and, and let's frame Christian living. We're going to summarize what we've been looking at so far. Framing Christian living. First thing we need to understand, the Christian living is about receiving the seed of the word of God. You can't live the Christian life unless the seed of God is planted in your heart. You have to respond to the gospel. You have to respond to Jesus Christ. That there is no Christian living without first having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, uh, 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 Christian living is about becoming seeds of the kingdom of God, which means it applies to our very essence, who we are to our core, that we are different because of Christ that is at work in our lives. Now, I know we all are in process. We all have things that we struggle through. But think about this. When you see a Christian lose their temper, right? They just, they fly off the handle. Within that moment, that Christian is not demonstrating that they are seed of the kingdom. Self is still on the throne. When someone pokes your buttons until you get to the place where you want to give them a piece of your mind, have mercy. In that moment of expression, it is not Christian living that is being manifested. Something else is being manifested. And so in those moments, I have to run back to the cross and say, Jesus, transform me, change me. That so often we think, and you know, I, 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 this paradox is just, it's, it, it, always, it always gets to me. You will have a good old Adventist um, who, who wants to stand by the standard. They see someone who is not dressed based on the church's standard. And the, the, the good old Adventist will go up to that person and, you know, tell them that they need to change. Tell them what they need to take off. But when you look at the spirit and the attitude, of the person who is telling the other person to take something off, you realize that they're so upset, they're so angry, they're so mad, they've lost their Christianity that they can't speak to another human being in a Christ-like way. That in that moment, in that moment, the person who is not demonstrating Christian living is not the person who is dressed inappropriately, but the person who is going after them in a spirit that does not reflect the character of Jesus. Jesus Christ, Christian living cuts across the board. It makes me feel uncomfortable as a pastor. There are times, my like, God, 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 there's no way I can stand in judgment of this. You are still working on me. Listen, Christian living causes all of us to look in the mirror and say, God, you've got some stuff to do in my life. Christian living is becoming the manifest kingdom of God. And that is for the entire church. So whenever I see or hear of a scandal uh, 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 of whatever sort that affects the Adventist church, it affects this third aspect of Christian living because it affects the entire church and it affects the mission of the church that you go out in some communities now and you say, I'm Adventist and they remember the scandal. They remember, well, yeah, your pastor was involved in this, this pastor. And, and you say, Lord, 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 have mercy. When would our people understand that their personal actions don't just affect them, they affect the very mission of the church that God has called to represent him in the world. All right, understanding Christian living, God is in us, and so he works in us. God plants us as individuals, and God plants us as a body. Moving on, realizing Christian living, we need to then make room for the maturing of the kingdom principles. That's how the word grows in our hearts. Our hearts represent the soil, and so we need to make room. In other words, it's not just getting the list of rules. The heart needs to be changed. The heart needs to be transformed. And so we need to start asking God, remove the things in my heart that make it impossible for the kingdom to thrive. The things that occupy my mind and occupy my attention that stands in the way of the word flourishing in me. Because if the word is able to flourish in me, no one has to give me the list of rules. The word is going to be manifested in my life. The rules are helpful. It's helpful to have them there. But it is even more powerful when the principles come as the outworking of the word of God in our lives. Realizing Christian living is about growing together until the harvest. In other words, God has a purpose for allowing us to dwell in the context that we're in. When we look at that parable, the, 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 the master says to the servant, let them grow together until the time of harvest. They are going to be placed in a context that's hostile. 
They're going to be placed in a context where they are beside uh, tears. They're beside uh, uh, seeds that are planted by the enemy. And the master says, let them grow together until the time of harvest. You will distinguish them at the harvest and you'll be able to tell the difference. But here's the thing. They have to grow together until the time of harvest, which means that Christian living is shaped within a hostile context, that God will intentionally put us in spaces and with people that will test us and try us. He will plan, <laughs> he would allow, he would allow some tears to be planted right next to you. He would allow some tears to be planted in your neighborhood. He would allow some tears to be planted right beside you in church. He will let the tears, he'll say, let them grow. And he says, I want you to be able to grow even when the context is not conducive, which means that you need to rely on God. Your character as a Christian is shaped sometimes in the crucible of the circumstances that God permits you to endure. And then finally, there is the transforming of the world. We cannot, as Adventists, talk about Christian living until and unless we are transforming the world, whether it's through the health message that God has given to us or the lifestyle principles that God has given to us. How are we transforming the world through our Christ-likeness? Are we head or are we tail? Are we following the world or are we representing Christ? This is for an organization. This is for an institution. But above all, this is for a movement. Here is what this means, that I then need to encourage my fellow brothers and sisters to live for Christ and allow Christ to live in us so that together we can make a difference because we can't be going at odds with each other uh, and expect to make a difference while culturally we might be different and culturally we might dress differently and we might have a, a, a different perspective on some of these things that at the core, Christ must be manifested in our lives. Here are some practical principles. I've shared some of these in our past presentation. Here's some practical implications. Christian living requires daily surrender to the growth process. It is a process that we need to surrender to every single day. Christian living is Christ living out his life within us. Every day, Jesus, live out your life within me. While rules and standards are necessary covenant uh, relationship guidelines, it's necessary to have those rules. It is necessary to have those guidelines. Christian living transcends laws and regulations. In other words, there is no way that anyone has the time or the wisdom to codify all of the obligations of Christian living. Whomever has done that, this is madness, right? That you can have the core principles, but if you're going to sit down and try, like the early rabbis, to multiply laws, don't do this in this circumstance, don't do that in that circumstance, this is insanity, right? There is no one who can really codify the vast gamut of what Christian living is all about. Christ is living in me, and as Christ lives in me, there are contextual and circumstantial things that would require the Spirit of God to give me wisdom. And so the rules are a good starter, but the rules cannot be ends in themselves. We have to go beyond that, right? That, that you think of this. There is no rule that says if you see a beggar on the street, you need to pause and, and, and help that beggar with something. There's no rule that says that. But Christ in you says, I see that beggar. I see that homeless person. There is something in me that calls forth this desire to help. That's why Jesus will say to those on the right hand in the end, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. And they're shocked. Wait, when did we see you? When did we? No, no, they didn't have to. They didn't have to. They recognized that this was their Christian obligation. There was no law that said they had to do this. They did this because Christ had changed them and they were now representing Christ. Christian living is at the heart of the great controversy. And we cannot escape that. That at the heart of this struggle that we're in, between good and evil, what we do in Christian living every single day determines who wins in our lives. It doesn't determine who ultimately wins the great controversy. God is going to win with or without us. But when in our lifestyle, when we demonstrate unrefined emotions, unrefined tempers, unrefined lust, when we demonstrate this sense that we have not been transformed in those moments, 
The devil wins in our lives. It's precisely for this reason why we need to surrender daily. Christian living is central to manifesting Christ in the world. We can't manifest Christ if we're not demonstrating this. So it is not just about the things that we have in our rule books. It goes beyond that. Are we manifesting Christ in the world? And it's going to be demonstrated through our Christian deportment, our simplicity, the simple beauty that comes through us, where what beckons people to us is not how attractive we have made ourselves, but how attractive Christ is in us. Christian living is living in conformity to the principles of the kingdom. Christian living then has to do with worship, service, being purposeful. The next slide. Uh, uh, it has to do with sacrifice. It's being non-conforming. It is being loving. It is being obedient. Here are the implications. I want to close with this quote. <clears throat> and, and this is something that I think uh, uh, really helps to pull this together for me. Um, it's from Counsels to the Church, uh, page 78. When you have some time, um, go and read it, but I'll read some portions of it. And why it says, it is God's purpose to manifest through his people the principles of the kingdom. That is Christian living. God wants to manifest his principles through us. It's not about what older Adventists want or want, what younger Adventists want. It's not about what those in Timbuktu want and what those in some other part. No, no, no. Christian living is God wanting to demonstrate his principles through us. That in life and character, they may reveal these principles in life and in character. Disposition, this is added in our attitude. It is not just about the way we dress. It is not just about jewelry. It is not just about diet. Notice, it is God wanting to reveal, reveal his principles in our life and character. It may be revealed these principles. His desire is to separate them. Watch this. To separate them, his people, from the customs, the habits, and the practices of the world. That is your conversion experience. You cannot represent Christ while your customs are identical to the Christ like uh, to the Christ less customs of the world when your habits are identical to someone who is not converted and your practices are the same as those who are not converted if if the people in the church and the people in the world are laughing at the same jokes going to the same places of entertainment drinking the same substances participating in the same activities something is wrong there needs to be a clear line of demarcation between representatives of Christ and those who are not representatives of Christ. He seeks to bring them near to himself, amen, that he may make known to them his will. Praise God, praise God. The purpose uh, 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 for which God seeks to accomplish through his people today is the same that he desired to accomplish through Israel when he brought them forth from Egypt. And you can read uh, uh, the rest of this at the heart of this. God wants a people, not just individuals. He wants a people to exemplify him in their love, in their attitudes, in their behavior. And God wants to elevate his people above all else so that others can see and say, I want what you have. I want to experience what you have uh, experienced in, in, your, um, in your journey. <clears throat> um, let's, uh, you can skip the next um, few slides and just go to nurturing the Christ life, nurturing the Christ life. When I concluded the last presentation, I ended with this, and I want to end with this again. To nurture the Christian living, especially in these uncertain times, one, we need to have a life of prayer. This is non-negotiable. We need to have a life of prayer. We need to spend time studying and meditating on God's word. Too often, we try to abide by the rules without digging into the word. And so we can find ourselves like the older prodigal son saying, I have done everything you asked me to do, daddy. Uh, uh, but yet we don't feel a part of the family because we don't have relationship with the daddy. That both need to go together. We need to do what the father desires us to do. But we also need to have relationship with the father through studying, meditating on the word, worship, both personal and collective, that we encourage each other and support each other in the journey. We need to have simplicity and solitude. And that this is a core principle of Christian discipleship or Christian discipline. That, that regardless of how much money we 
have, regardless of what we can afford, simplicity is a core principle. Challenge yourself to simplicity. That you may have a hundred pairs of shoes and you've convinced yourself that because you don't have on earrings and because you don't uh, 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 have on whatever else that we shouldn't have, uh, uh, that you are fine. But, but, but having a hundred pairs of shoes is not simplicity. Right, that 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 you 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 may have you may have fifty suits, fifty suits. There is no way that you're wearing all of those suits, right? And you may say, well, 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 I'm not eating pork, right? But but Christian simplicity challenges us to the core. That that am I living in a way where the simple beauty of Christ can shine through me? Fasting. Self-denial. When we fast, we take the time to submit ourselves to God so that he can exercise sovereignty over us. But I also talked about feasting. We need to take the time to celebrate as well that this is not just this long phase journey. No, no, no. We need to take time to laugh. We need to take time to just celebrate the goodness of God. I don't know about you, but the time is I will turn on uh, uh, my music and I will just give God praise. I will glorify him. I will thank him. You need to celebrate. It's part of your Christian experience, service, ministry, sharing, get involved in ministry. It will challenge you when you see that others are just dying and longing uh, for uh, the good news of grace. A spiritual accountability. Get some uh, spiritual accountability groups. Get other partners in this ministry. Have a group and say, we're going to pray together. We're going to challenge each other to Christian living. We're going to hold each other accountable in this journey so that we can overcome uh, uh, together. And then we need to examine our faith. Take the time to examine our faith. Several years ago, when I was doing my practicum um, for evangelism at Andrews University, um, I had to go to New York for an evangelistic meeting. A uh, group of friends and myself, we were coming from this series and we um, we saw this beggar at the side of, 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 of the street. Now, now we were there um, in New York for evangelism. And, and so as we're passing, uh, the spirit of God impressed on my heart uh, to stop and give this beggar something. Um, now, there was no law that said I had to do this. I was a poor student, uh, so I had struggles myself with finances, but it weighed heavily on my heart. And so I told my colleagues, I said, stop, stop the car so that I can give uh, this beggar um, something. They said, James, are you crazy? This is New York. You're not going to do this. I said, no, no, stop the car. Stop the car. I need to, I need to, I need to do this. And 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 so I'm like, okay, okay, all right. Um, uh, they're struggling through this. Stop the car. And so they finally stopped the car. And 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 at first I was going to take uh, uh, the, the the little money and put it on the side of the street for the beggar. Uh, and God says, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You need to go and give it to him, pray for him and bless him. And so I that's what I did. I went, prayed for him, gave him the money. God bless you, left. Uh, the following week we were having a baptism and there's a gentleman who came up to me and, and he was in his baptismal robe. Um, and, and, and he said, um, you may not remember this, but last week um, yourself and your colleagues gave me a ride. I was coming from the evangelistic meeting and I needed a ride and, and you gave you guys gave me a ride. I was sitting in the car and I was battling about whether or not I would give my heart to the Lord. I heard the message um, and I was battling. And he says, I saw the conversation that took place between you um, and, and your colleagues. And he said, when you insisted on stopping the car and you didn't go out and just put the money on the side of the street and you went, and place that money in that beggar's hand. He says, that is what convinced me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm getting baptized because I saw Jesus in you. Christian living is Christ being manifested in our lives. Father, challenge us, help us to live a life that will honor you so that people will see Jesus in us. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our colleagues are going to come together and we're going to discuss. Uh, we're going to take some questions. Uh, praise God. Amen, amen. 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 We are just blessed as you broke down a biblical understanding. Um, 
uh, of what it means to live a Christian life. But I'm just going to ask um, from my other colleagues, um, it, what, was there anything specifically that stood out to you? I, I know this is an important topic that we find ourselves fighting over in, in church conversations, AY programs. What would you say is one thing that stood out to you in this presentation? I think that's not a fair question, Pastor. <laughs> to choose from, huh? There are just so many things that are out there, but uh, we we certainly will try our best. You know, uh, for me, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Anson, I really appreciate the energy that you have uh, brought to this, uh, the way how it came across. Uh, it's a blessing to me personally, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people have uh, f are feeling the same way. Uh, one of the things that stuck out to me personally, perhaps it's because of recent researches that I've done, is the connection between the spiritual and the physical. Because what happens is that we have the tendency to uh, engage in discipline, Christian discipline that helps the mind the emotion and those things to grow while neglecting the physical aspect um, of what it really means to be a child of God. And so that connection that you drew there, I thought that was very uh, interesting. And, and, and I would also say that, you know, being healthy physically is very much a part of worshiping God as being emotionally and with our minds and so forth. But the physical context, it, it is something that one really needs to pay attention to. And it's not because we want to eat well, exercise and sleep and do all those things that will enhance ourselves physically to make us feel better or to make us look better. But it all boils down to one purpose. Are we glorifying God in those things that we're doing? And so that is one of the things that actually really, really stuck out to me in the in this seminar. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, for me, I think the, the focus on um, Christ uh, is an important focus. Um, thanks for your comprehensive presentation on this important issue of Christian living. Uh, but Christ uh, being first and the very source of our lives and um, Christian living being the outflow. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important distinction to make. How be it many times we judge the presence of Christ by the outflow. Mm -hmm. uh, it is true and false at the same time. Yeah. Recognizing the fact that we are, <laughs> we are faulty and at core we are still sinful, not until the second advent. Uh, will we, uh, uh, the sinful nature, be removed from us? Uh, this is why the spiritual battle continues. And uh, Christian living is not merely in diet, agree? It is in diet, but not only. Um, jewelry, dress, yes. It is in many other aspects of our lives, our thought life, that which is secret and hidden from anybody, which does not manifest itself in in anger, in gossip, but it's way in our heads that only God knows. <laughs> this is also Christian living from the perspective of the divine. Uh, um, so even, even aspects that may not have been touched, issues of uh, uh, politics in the church, <laughs> which people tend to think that it's not part of Christian living <laughs> and uh, anything can go. This is a big one, especially around the elections. It's dog and dog. Mm -hmm. So this is an important aspect to Christian living. But I think the general trend and the overall um, picture that uh, Pastor Janssen presented is very beneficial to the church. Amen. Amen. I, I want to kind of throw it out to everyone first because I was in the same boat. There was just so many different points um, to, 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 to pick from. But I... If I had to sum up, I think the, the, the idea, it really turns um, upside down the, the Adventist perspective when we talk about Christian living. And I, I wonder if some of that, as you, you described earlier, has to do with our history. Um, whereas the, 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 the Seventh-day Adventist church 
emerged in a context where we were in a highly Christianized society. And to some degree, it might be perceived that the work of the Christian, of the Adventist church, was to help to bring reform to things that other Christians weren't doing. And so it might have been presumed that there was a relationship in Christ, with Christ. And so it was just the Adventist role to focus on outward behavior. But ultimately, as we, we come to the, to the crux of the matter, it really is about heart transformation. And so, you know, sometimes the emphasis is always put on looking right, on fitting the part, on looking like a good Adventist. You know, I think this really now challenges us that being a good Adventist doesn't necessarily mean that you're necessarily a good Christian because it's not supposed to, we, as we presume, and I'm gonna say this carefully because I know there's Adventists on the line, but we presume that because you are a good Adventist, then you are a good Christian. But we must recognize that based on what you've described, particularly using the, the seed analogy, is that there is an organic type of relationship that has to take place. And it's not one that begins on the outside in. You don't watch a tree grow from the outside inward into the soil. The growth that's taking place takes place underneath the soil where nobody can see it. Now you can take a dead tree, stick it into a soil and say, I have a tree. But ultimately, if that's all you've done, the tree will ultimately die. The same like our Christian walk. If we are not allowing that seed to germinate on the inside, that transformation, that relationship with Christ to happen on the inside, then we are completely lost. When you talked about how that, 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 that dynamic of the relationship with Christ and how Christian living is an outgrowth of that, I thought how well this is manifested even in the context of Exodus 20, where we are quick to, to run to the 10 commandments. These are the 10, you know, have no other gods, not under no graven images, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. And we can go through and recite them. But we always leave out the first part of, the, of Exodus 20, which says, I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Salvation comes before that transformation. Tran salvation is the fruit or the byproduct of the transformation of the outward transformation that we ultimately will see and manifest. I, I, I'm gonna stop there because I, 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 I'll be honest with you, you, you're just throwing things all up the place and I'm just like, mercy. So while we're, while we're gonna talk for a little bit, um, I don't know if there are any questions that individuals have put in the chat. We're gonna try to use what time we have to answer questions, but the good news is today, there's part two. Amen. Amen. So Amen. what we don't get today, what we don't get to today, we had some technical difficulties, so it delayed us a little bit. But if we don't get to it today, tune in March 13th for part two. So I'm putting in our plug now because this promises to shape our Christian world. I, what, what do you think? Well, let me ask the question, um, and I'll throw this out to any one of my, my colleagues. Why do you think this discussion is so relevant, particularly as we are talking about living in the last days. Why would you say that this conversation needs to be had now more than ever as we are, are, are watching the last days unfold in front of us? Um, if I may attempt to answer that, I think it's important for uh, many reasons. I'll, I'll start with one. Um, we, we are designed primarily uh, to be in relationship with Christ. Right. Uh, that's what we're designed for. Um, Paul talks about, you know, the fact that God is working that masterpiece. Uh, he's creating, recreating the image of Christ within us. And uh, within that context, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, but in the context of evangelism and as we are looking forward to the second coming of Christ and planning for. Uh, this evangelistic outreach. There is a component to it that I think that Dr. Yanson, you have so eloquently summarized it. And I think in substance, what I gathered is that while we are designed to be in relationship with Christ, right? And uh, while we're seeking to become more like him, functionally, 
this growth must also show up in our relationships with others. What do I mean by that? In other words, um, you, 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 you talked earlier about the fact that um, someone can be seeking to become so more like Christ. Uh, they do all the spiritual disciplines, the Bible studies, the prayers, and going to church and so forth. But then in another context, as we relate to other, we see a drastic difference um, between who the person is or have the, the person's actions uh, while the person is in church or doing spiritual things. The point is that as we seek to reflect Christ, what we learn on the inside, those principles that transform our lives must also transform our relationship with the significant others or others for that matter. And uh, uh, one of the thing that I, I, I realized as Christian and even in myself, Pastor Jansen, you talk about it earlier, it, it's dangerous as ministers to how we talk about Christian living um, because we have to examine ourselves as well. How do we respond in certain situations? Uh, you know, because our self-awareness or lack of self-awareness could also drive someone away from us. And so we, you know, and what I what I mean by self-awareness, it has all to do with our emotional wellness and those things. You know, our relationship with Christ must show up in all of those areas of our lives when we interact with folks because our witnesses can become ineffective. If if we have a if we're a good Bible student, we pray and preach like Paul and whatever it is, but that growth that we experience must inform and must show up in our relationship with others. You talked about, Pastor Jansen, the fact that that gentleman was in that car. And the thing that brought him to Christ was not necessarily the preaching of the gospel, but it's your relationship that drew him to Christ. And this is something that I'm so glad that you mentioned that because uh, um, what, some things that recently I've done some, some research and some studies and I've discovered that a lot of times as Christians, uh, uh, we, we may not necessarily be aware of some things that we are communicating to others that may be put offs, right? And one of the things that re some research have shown is that low self-awareness, there is a connection to low self-awareness and the way how we sleep. In other words, if, if, if we don't rest well, our ability to be who we are, to be self-aware and to interact with others, it, it's drastically diminished. I know that I'm the same person when I don't get a lot of rest. And so this Christian living, it shows up in so many areas of our lives that impact other areas in ways that you don't imagine. Another question is, you know, let's say a person have challenges with, let's say, jewelry. That's one of the big things. What is it that caused someone to be, become so enamored and so in love with this particular custom that they would do or spend it, it not only with jewelry, but it may be a watch, you may be watch, it may be a car, but something that reflects, uh, uh, um, you know, extravagance. You know, is there something that that person might be trying to use these things as medication? And those are some things that we, we, we need to think about as we think about this whole concept of Christian living. But the fact is that our relationship with Christ, you know, that's our primary goal. We're primarily designed to be in relationship with him, to be restored, to be like him. But that must also... Uh, show up functionally in other relationships as well. And then we can begin to draw Christ. You see, many times it's not just the things that we say or we don't say or the things that we wear or we don't wear, but it is, it is the actions that sometimes speak louder than words. And quite frankly, sometimes we are not aware that we are giving off those signals. You know, so it all comes to the concept of, uh, you know, self-awareness. 
you know, asking God to not only to grow us emotionally and spiritually, but also give us that ability to become aware of the messages that we may be sending to others. Amen, amen, amen. You know, thank you, thank you so much, I'm Pastor Dillion. And um, and I, I I'm we're gonna try to get to some of the questions. I see some questions popping into the chat. So, Dr. Kassan, did you wanna add anything? Um, and then we'll try to get to some of the questions in the chat. I see questions slowly starting to come in. I think it is important, um, significantly as uh, uh, an important question we probably need to answer. Do we make a distinction between legalism and, and obedience? Mm -hmm. In the process of talking about the art group of, of Christian life, uh, uh, of, the, in, of Christian living, um, do we make a distinction between legalism and obedience? Because it seems to me as Adventists, we tend to confuse the two. Uh, we even tend to get rid of obedience because we call it legalism. Uh, and then at the same time, we still want to emphasize obey the Lord. Uh, our Christian lives must live up to the highest ideals. You know, uh, I think it is important to, demo, to, to indicate that when we talk about legalism, generally it's in the context of using that which you do um, as a means to salvation. Mm -hmm. That's the context in which we generally present it. And this is the correct context. Um, but God requires us to obey. Yes. And uh, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men and they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So good works is to glorify God. But notice that it indicates that um, that they may see your good works. It is referring to human beings. Okay? Uh, our good works is for rewards. This is important. It's for rewards. Our good works are a reflection of our imitation of Christ, our growth in Christ. They are not for salvation, but many times we use it as a measure, a barometer as to one's relationship with God. I mean, even in our discussion, we use it as a direct link to demonstrate how Christ like somebody is. But we also recognize the fact that someone can have the external religious trappings and still not have a relationship with God and still leave the faith and still be in criminal activity. So, um, I think the other question that is coming up as to the heart may be an important discussion along that line. So I'll let it come up. Wonderful. So one of the questions that came out from the chat was what should we tell friends who say that God only looks at the heart? And you're absolutely right. That was a great segue in. And I'm just going to pause and just take a note and just say that we're going to keep praying. Uh, Pastor Cadet is not feeling well today. I'm filling in his spot, but I'm realizing how big the shoes are. Um, so, but we, I know you're probably missing Pastor Cadet, but let's keep him in keep him in prayer. He wasn't feeling well today. And so let's continue with the question. What should we tell friends who say that God only looks at the heart? Oh, you're on mute. I'll start us off. I think Pastor, uh, Dr. Castain uh, laid the foundation that, that obedience is a natural outworking of that imitation of Christ, Christ in us. Very often when people say Christ, look, God looks at the heart, um, they're misinterpreting Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, um, which says, rend your heart and not your garment. Um, and so people will build off of that and say, God only looks at the heart. Now, so here's the thing. When you look at, and when you have some time, look at Joel chapter to two, God is actually saying, if you're truly repentant, mm -hmm. don't just go around tearing your clothes as an act of, 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 of showing that you're sorry. Let your heart be broken. Within this context, God does look at the heart. In the experience with Samuel, as he's going to anoint uh, kings, he looks at the older sons of Jesse and he says, yeah, this must be the one. And God says to him, no, 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 I don't see the way that human beings see. And here's the challenge. Because God looks at the heart, God is more than concerned about our actions. Our actions are important because our actions come from the heart. So God sees the source. 
before he sees the outworking. On the other hand, someone's works might be good, but the heart is messed up. So when someone when someone says God looks at the heart, yes, in, in, in so many ways, God looks at the heart. But this is not uh, to be mistaken with what Joel uh, 2.13 says, where it says, rend your heart. People translate it or say, render your heart. It says, rend, tear, tear, let your heart be broken. Uh, 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 and, and that's how you show repentance. But there are several passages in scripture where, where God is looking at the heart because he knows the state um, of the human heart. That's why we have to be authentic. Uh, we're doing Christian living, as I said. Christian living is not to impress others. It is to give honor and glory to God. We may fool others, but we can't fool God. Amen. 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 Dr. Kastang, you sounded like you had wanted to add something um, to that before. <laughs> Um, what I would say is uh, to add to this question, I, I would agree with the question, with the, the, the way the question is asked, that it, truly God looks at the heart. Yes. Uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think it is understood in the statement that God doesn't judge us by our occasional misdeeds and wrong deeds. Mm -hmm. Human beings may, but by the general tendency of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any human being who never got angry at certain points. And people express anger in different ways. Mm -hmm. Resentment silence for days on end <laughs> so true. some with rage you see like this picture i have behind me it's simmer simmering that's a for spring in saint lucia <laughs> a driving volcano <laughs> mercy so um uh, the, the, the idea is when we look at heart we we're thinking of the general tendency of the person's life uh, I think this is correct, that God looks at the heart. Um, that does not mean that there cannot be a judgment on actions. There can be a judgment of act on actions. It doesn't matter. You can have a good motive. You can have a, 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 a motive of loving somebody and, uh, and doing something evil to them at the same time, something painful or hurtful to them. Yeah. So the motive if you want to refer this as the heart, does not always purify the act. There is a judgment also on the act for the Christian. Uh, that is why there are command the commandments clearly says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. You can say, I love a woman, and you go and sleep with her. Now, that's, that's just by the act. It is the heart that God is looking at, and if the heart is love. So you see the problem. God has a judgment on the heart. He has also a judgment on our actions. And in every aspect, too, not merely in the sexual department, in the political department, in the professional department, you just go down the line. God has a judgment on all of these things, which has to be aligned uh, with his requirements. Mm -hmm. um, given the fact we must understand the Christian life, uh, that um, we are sinful by nature. And this sinful nature now and again can, uh, if we are not controlled by the spirit and we are not in connection with God, can pop its ugly head and impact us anytime. That is why humility requires for us not to think of ourselves as I haven't arrived, but from the perspective that I have to be dependent on God every day. That kind of dependence uh, prevents us from feeling any sense of spiritual superiority. Amen. Amen. And if I might just add, because um, I think both of you bring out two extremely important principles. When we talk about the, the, the general um, inclination of a man's heart or our life, but we must always still remember that there is a standard, a, a standard that sits above human comprehension, um, um, a tolerance, um, ultimately, which is God's standard. His righteousness is not our righteousness. And what we as humans might be either judgmental or tolerant of. We recognize that despite what our motives are, there is still an accountability to God that transcends what we what we ourselves might be tolerant of. You know, I, I, I oftentimes um, um, think of the story of Uzzah, and, I, and that was one of the stories that when I, I was a, a young Christian, I struggled with. Because, you know, sometimes people do good things for bad reasons, you know? They, they're, they're selfish in their actions, so they do good things to get a benefit. Sometimes people do bad things 
with good intentions. Mm. And so you, you recognize that the action might be bad, but their motives were, were good. But when I thought of Uzza, here was someone who was doing, by all intents and purposes, an action that was good. He was steadying the ark from falling. In and of itself, that, by human standard, is not a negative action. It's not destructive. It's actually trying to be helpful. His motive was to preserve the ark of God from, from any, any, any action or from any detriment or any heart, um, harm. So his motive, as well as his actions, by human standard, would be characterized as good. But yet, the response recorded in 2 Samuel is that when God saw Uzzah's action, that yet he was still punished with death. But we recognize that God's standard requires a certain amount of obedience mm. because God had been clear for, for, for centuries <laughs> that no one but the priest should touch the ark. And so we recognize that there still remains a higher standard that within the context of this world, we don't necessarily like to, to hold to the fact that there is a God who has the final say on morality and the moral order. Mm. The fact is that as creator God, he is the one who originates the, what, what the standards of morality is. We as humans might evaluate it, which is why at the, uh, in, in, the, second, in the, the, the second phase of the, uh, of the judgment, why we get to examine the books so we can actually see what God sees. But we recognize that in all of this, while there are certain things we might put to our, to our, our subject, our subjective understanding, God still has a standard of obedience. And that's the standard he ultimately holds to. And when we talk about Christian living then, it reminds us that it's not about what's acceptable to man. It's not about what's acceptable to, even to us. But ultimately, what is the standard God is calling for? And if his standard is so high that someone like Uzzah can both with a right motive and with a good action still be in disobedience to God, then that should cause us to take a look then at whether or not our, our, our modes our modes of trying to build that right relationship with God has really been emphasized in the right way. And I think this, 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 this workshop is really teaching us that when we talk, when it comes to sin, it's not subject to any organization or institution or person. It's really about that relationship we have with God. And if we really want to transcend this carnal living, it means that we must die like that seed. We have got to die. Just as the seed died in us, we have got to die so that God can then do a work of growth in us. I think an important question to be asked at this juncture is uh, what is our responsibilities as uh, uh, what is our responsibility as leaders, as pastors, as elders, as whatever position we occupy in the church to hold up the bar of righteousness? Um, uh, what is our risk? That's an important question to ask. The very fact that we are presenting Christian living suggests something mm -hmm. that we believe that it is there's to some degree it is not left to the individual and God that we are trying to educate conscience. Uh, so my question is, what responsibility do we have? Because if we put it as something like pie in the sky in which it is unreachable except by the individual that God communicates to them in some way that nobody else knows, then what would be the need for our presentation on that important subject? This is the first uh, pers uh, pers uh, question on this matter. Uh, the, the, the other one would be, uh, what is our responsibility uh, to hold up the standard of righteousness in the church? Uh, this is an important question, especially if one man's meat is another man's poison and one man's wisdom is another man's folly. Uh, what is our role? Now, I say this in context of Christ himself being the perfect human being, but he had Pharisees who wanted to throw him over the cliff. Over the cliff. Huh? We, had, we have a Jesus Christ who never reconciled with, with those people. He even went into, into the temple and, and turned, turned over the tables, threatening them in one way or another because of their sin right in his father's house. The, the real question is, how do we account for those um, response to sin? 
by Christ himself, in which even the perfect Christ was not able to get full reconciliation with the Sadducees and Pharisees. We read it over and over again. They said he had a devil. They call him all different names. So really, the question is, when we're talking about Christian living, in context of the great controversy between good and evil, how do we really negotiate a path as leaders to lead the church to a place where we have some degree of common understanding? Mm -hmm. So um, I, what the, the, what uh, Dr. Castan raises is very, very critical. The word of God is the standard for Christian living. That's the seed that is planted in us, that we, we can't run away from that foundation of the word of God. There are some clear principles that are taught in the word of God, um, and that's what we follow. Our responsibility as um, leaders is to make sure that we uphold that standard of scripture um, with the understanding and with the humility um, that we are all in process as well. But the fact that we are in process does not give us the license to diminish um, the high standards that um, uh, uh, scripture sets um, for Christian for Christian living. Um, and within that process, we will encounter, like Christ, uh, situations where um, there will be contention. We would uh, uh, engage with others who might not see things the way that we see things. Um, but never must it be said um, that we were on Christ-like. Um, and I'm not saying that from the standpoint of human beings, but being able to stand before God, that it, we must never dishonor Christ in the way that we um, work through um, those, those kinds of, of situation. We need to keep those things um, in tension um, as, we, as, as we work this through. So the standard is Christ. Um, and and, and we, you know, we don't need to go outside of that. We do have the clear, thus saith the Lord, as it relates to Christian living. Where it becomes challenging is when we have to now pastor within contexts where there are cultural things related to some of the ways that the church has interpreted some of these standards of scripture. So while scripture teaches us modesty and scripture teaches us simplicity, that's what the Bible gives us. The Bible does not give us a pattern as to how, what style we need to um, sew our dress or sew our suit. Uh, the Bible does not uh, uh, tell us how tight or how loose our outfits uh, need to be, um, that we interpret uh, uh, modesty within certain cultural contexts. Several years ago, um, I, I went to visit, went back to Suriname. I grew up there. I went back to Suriname um, and, and I went with a pastor to the Maroon community um, and I'm walking into the community and and, and all the women were topless and they had this, this kind of skirt wrapped around. And of course, I'm walking with my hands over my eyes like this. Um, and I'm like, this, this here um, is, is, is he modest? Uh, this here is, is, and you know, I, I, I had all kinds of words as it related to this. This is ungodly, unchristlike. And, and, and the pastor stopped me and says, by whose standard, mm -hmm. right? That within that context and within that community, their norms was that people who dressed like Europeans, they were dressing, dressing to tempt uh, 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 people. Uh, and so they considered them prostitutes. That if I were then ministering within a context like that, even though the norm in scripture is simplicity, the norm in scripture is modesty, how we apply that in various cultures might be different, but the standard itself doesn't change. I think that's a very good point. And it comes to one of the questions that was asked as it pertains to culture. And I think this, this becomes an area when you talk about pastoral leadership is being able to help people to decipher and, and, and um, distinguish um, where, where culture fits in to, to the whole context. Cause you know, it's, it's so funny, the spirit was leading because I, I was just thinking about that type of an example. And um, when Pastor Jensen, you just brought that up because you know, I remember and taking a sociology class once where they talked about the, the cultures where toplessness in that community was simply utilitarian. So it was not anything that was seen as a, a sexual type of, of experience. And so now many of us in North America could not conceptualize or of, 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 um, of pastoring in that culture where that is the norm. But 
you know, we, we now that might be a more extreme for, for many of us to consider. But when we talk about different things such as even color suits, I, I, you know, just for example, I remember when I first started pastoring and I, I, I liked, uh, truth, I like bright color suits. My, my wife helped me tone down. But I used to just go with the light grays, you know? And I remember walking into a church environment where that was deemed as being ir immodest as a pastor. You're wearing a light colored suit. You're supposed to have black suits. I'm just like, you can only have so many black suits. But these are, 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 are things that, and, and, and you, you learn the culture. But sometimes the, these aspects of the cultures can become um, divisive amongst, amongst, amongst churches. Because sometimes we, instead of allowing the Bible to still inform and guide, now it starts to be between who is right and who is wrong. So I'm going to have to do this. Um, and I'm, I'm apologizing um, because I'm looking at the time. I'm looking at the questions. And we want to do justice. But I'm so glad we have a part two. We don't have to create. Maybe um, what we can do, Pastor Jensen, um, we have a couple of questions here. We'll save them. We'll start them at the beginning. And then we will go into part two of our presentation. I want to just thank um, all of our pastors um, again for, for being a part of this discussion. I know it's areas that we, we wrestle with um, and that in different churches, and you can move from one church on one side of the city to another church on another side of the city. And you can find various perspectives as to what is right and what is wrong. I've been in churches where you know, they, they're, they're fighting over drums. I, I, I went across town to a church where they were fighting over whether even to play a piano. And, you know, it's, you, you will find a variety of different things. And now, ultimately, and, and, and this will be a challenge is, you know, as we're wrestling through those things, how do we address them in a way that ultimately still brings glory to God and not shows that our church or, or brings us as individuals in a matter that's divisive. I pray that we will continue to seek Christ, that we will continue to seek his leading, and that we will continue to allow him to be able to, to, to show us um, how we can most, most um, effectively represent him in these uncertain times, but most, most importantly, to represent him, to help others as they are seeking their way. Because you know, most people, and I don't know if you found this um, as well, um, pastors, most people I know that have left my churches do it for the majority, not because of doctrine. Very few in, in my years of ministry can I, can I, can I re recall people leaving because of doctrine. But it's because of the interactions, because they've been hurt, because Christ wasn't reflected. And sometimes it's intentionally, sometimes it's not intentionally. But ultimately, Christian living does have a great impact even on other people's walk of faith. And so go ahead, Pastor, uh, Pastor Gustang. And then <laughs> after you share your comments, can I have you give us our closing prayer and our media team. If you're ready with that video, we just have a little promotion for the Academy at the end of the prayer um, that you can play after Dr. Gustang has prayed. Hey, uh, the only thing I'm going to say, uh, I think as leaders, we got to be moral authorities and we got to stand uh, for what is right. Uh, not only present it and duck after, we must be willing to stand. And obviously in standing sometimes there will be conflict. There can even be division in church because even Jesus Christ himself, himself said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. And he was really talking about uh, certain principles that can cut, cut even relational ties. Mm -hmm. Therefore, even within the church, uh, uh, the Bible does talk about there is a war. It uses very military terms. There was a war in heaven. Now it's supposed to be the purest of place. My point is, um, everything must not be put into a military context, given. But we have a church of sinners, of which we are part. And many times, issues are, that occur within the church along Christian living can cause problems in understanding problems in relationships. These relationships, in one way or another, we should have a ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But understand, as much as possible, live peaceably for all men. Mm -hmm. But we must understand, even in the context of heaven, we had a war 
that has continued up to this present time. The perfect God could not resolve it. The perfect God cannot resolve it and he will resolve it in the great conflagration. That is not to encourage war in church, but to let us know that we are in a context that can persist depending on the principles that people use in church. And even in context, I mean, we look at it even in terms of, of, of Adventist election at the church, at the conference, and these other places. We look at it in terms of our own relationships, where there is disagreement between husband and wife, or even the, with the children, the way they are living, and you're trying to insist on certain principles. We have those things existing right down the line. And standing for principle does not always mean that one, or that it does not always mean that one is encouraging war in that context. But sometimes there is growth and sometimes it requires a painful path. Mm -hmm. And we must acknowledge this part. If, if our perspective is always to duck and to take the path of least resistance, it may be a situation where the church will not grow, we will not grow, and everybody must be kept happy in the process. But mm -hmm. as I study the Bible and I recognize even how God deals with it, that God is not all that way, nor is he all the other way. It is not all war, it is not all peace, but obviously it is the path of principle. It's like the coin. You have the tail, you have the heads, but you have the cutting edge of principle, and that's where God expects us mm -hmm. to stand. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we want to thank you for this discussion presented through your man servant, Pastor Janssen. We want to thank you for the rest of us who have contributed. We want to thank you for your people. We pray, Lord, that you may bless every one of us as we seek a closer walk with you, a closer relationship with you. We pray, Lord, that your principle, your values, and your life may be manifested in us to give us a life of righteousness, to give us a life of forgiveness, to give us a life of humility, to give us a life of power and one in which we can clearly manifest your virtues and your values to others and we may grow in you until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. want to thank you once again for joining us. Dr. Jensen, we are looking forward to part two. And so please plan to join us on the 13th of March for part two of Christian Living. And once again, may God continue to bless each and every one of you. We invite you just to linger for a moment. Um, to Brother Stefan, I don't know if we have that video already, but there is a fundraising activity for our academy. Um, so take a look. And if you can join us, please do plan to join us. Go ahead. God bless. Everyone, please invite your family and friends to come to Berea's SCA Academy's Business Expo fundraiser. We start at 3 p.m. tomorrow, Sunday afternoon. All the proceeds from this event will help Christian education to continue. Join us at the Berea SCA Academy's Zoom to participate in learning about this event at 617-427-2201. And that is the code for the Berea SDA's Zoom. Thank you.